Who were the Tua Hedadanan? Of all the characters of Irish mythology, it is the Tua Hedadanan that attract the most interest, speculation and rumour. We hear them described as being like men, only with godlike abilities, the performers of great feats and deeds. We hear them described as masters of magic, with the power to command the weather, summon spectres, to heal, to feed, and even raise the dead after battle. They come to Ireland mysteriously. One account describes magical mist floating on the sky. More sober accounts say that they set their ships on fire to prevent retreat, the smoke being a more rational explanation for the magical mist. But no matter what way we choose to look at the Tua Hadadanan, we cannot escape the altogether mystical and otherworldly nature of this group of beings in Irish mythology. When they came to Ireland, they first settled on Iron Mountain, Schlieve on Iran, in County Leitrim, and they concealed their presence with a magical mist. They brought four magical artefacts to Ireland from the four mythical island cities of Murius, Baelius, Gurius, and Findius. These magical artefacts were Cor Nadagda, or the cauldron of the Dagda, who was the good god and the father god of the Tuatha de Danann. And this cauldron never emptied, no matter how much was eaten from it. It was the Gay Bolga, a magical spear or sleg, which belonged to the god Lu. No battle could be sustained against it. It entered the body at one point and made thirty wounds inside, and was used by Cúchulain when Lu, in the form of his divine father, appeared to help him defeat the men of Ireland in the Tom Cooley epic. They brought Anclay of Sullus, the Sword of Light which belonged to Nuada, who was the king of the Tuatha de Danann when they arrived in Ireland. And finally, they brought that famous Anlia Fall, the Stone of Destiny, which let out a scream whenever a rightful king placed his foot upon it and was housed for a time on Knuck Chower, the hill of Tara in County Mead, which was an ancient focal point of Irish rule. There are a few different theories about the meaning of their name, but it is most commonly accepted to mean the peoples of the goddess Danu as this was the name used by the medieval Gaelic literati to refer to the old pre-Christian gods. The words Tuatha de Danann have been translated as people from the word Tuatha, of the goddess from the word De, and Danu from the word Danan. This Danu, sometimes Dana or Anna or Anu, was a primordial mother goddess of the Tuatha de Danann. As far as India and as ancient as the Rig Vedas, we find mention of a primordial goddess of the same name, Danu, mother of a demonic serpent being called Ritra, who kept the waters of the world captive until he was defeated by Indra. Potential links can also be drawn with the Roman Diana, goddess of nature, the hunt and the moon, and the Greek Dion, who was an ancient titaness, a wife of Zeus, and whose very name simply means goddess. Further comparisons have also been made to Danu in River Danube, which housed many Celtic settlements along its basin. All of this would suggest that the Tuatha de Danann were a group of early migrants to Ireland and whose knowledge and skill was advanced compared to that of the native inhabitants. And it was advanced to the point that they were perceived to be more than men, the bringers of order, farming, art and higher civilization. The following quote is taken from Seamus McManus's Story of the Irish Race. Quote, such a great people were the Dedanon, and so uncommonly skilled in the few arts of their time, that they dazzled even their conquerors and successors, the Milesians, into regarding them as mighty magicians. Later generations of the Milesians, to whom were handed down the wonderful traditions of the wonderful people they had conquered, lifted them into a mystic realm, their greatest ones becoming gods and goddesses, who supplied to their successors a beautiful mythology. Most conquerors come to despise the conquered, but here they came to honour, almost to worship those whom they had subdued, which proves not only greatness in the conquered, but also bigness of mind and distinctiveness of character in the conquerors. The Dedanan skill in the arts and crafts in course of time immortalised itself in beautiful legends among the Milesians." End quote. All this works its way nicely into another interpretation of the name Tuatha de Tannen. 
As I just mentioned, the word Tua means a people, something like a tribe or race or country, or in another sense, a social order. The word Day means a god or a goddess, or spiritual or divine. But the word Danan, in this alternative theory, has been interpreted to connect to the word Dan or Dana, meaning poetry and suggestive of skill in art and craft. From this view, the Tua had a Danan, are a group of people who introduced a new advanced social order, the Tua, a spirituality, the Day, and arts, poetry, and craft, that is high culture, the Dana, to Ireland. In other places, they are sometimes described as the Fear Dea, meaning men of the goddess, the ever living ones, because they were immortal, the Ace She, because they were the people of the hills, or of the hollow hills, who are the fairies we hear of in the Irish fireside stories. They are called the Fear Trinia, or the men of tree gods in some of the sagas. And later this same term, Fear Trinia, would come to describe the Christian missionaries who sought to propagate the concept of a Christian religion based on a triune godhead among the native people. And since Danu had only three sons, Brian, Yuchar and Yuchavar, it is taught that the three gods in Fir Trinia is in reference to these three sons. The sovereignty of the Tua headed Danon over Ireland would later be challenged and the kingship seized by a new wave of migrants known as the Milesians, who also had druids and magic, poetry and laws, and whose lineages would continue to rule Ireland for years to come. Having landed on the island, the invaders were met by three goddesses of the Tua headed Danon, Iru, Banva and Fola who were the wives of the last three kings of the Tua Hedadanan, and as goddesses, symbolised the sovereignty of the land. Each one uttered a blessing and asked the Milesians to name the island after herself if they were successful in battle. Iru became the dominant name, up until the current day where we see Ireland rendered as Ira in Gaelic, but we also find the names Banva and Fola as affectionate and poetic references to Ireland. The Milesians finally conquered the Tuatha Dé Danann at the Battle of Teltu, at a place near the Hill of Tara. Once defeated, Amargin, who was the chief druid of the Milesians, had the responsibility of dividing the island between the two factions. He cunningly allotted the land above ground to the Milesians and the land below ground to the Tuatha Dé Danann. A variant on this tale has the Tuatha Dé Danann assembling at Brunaboyne after their defeat to hold a council led by Manon and MacLear. Having debated their predicament, they chose both Jarg, the son of the Dagda, as their new king, and they decided to scatter themselves to the eternal land of the other world under the hills of Ireland. The principal figures of the two Adedanan established their otherworldly palaces, or brew, within prominent mounds, many of which still exist to this day. Some of the key characters make appearances as gods and goddesses in both the Ulster and Fenian cycles sometimes taking the form of a divine parent or appearing to lend guidance or support to a warrior in need. But it's important to note that they are not worshipped as gods and goddesses in a religious sense in the other cycles. In some cases, human remains have even been found inside the passages of these mounds, leading archaeologists to interpret them as burial mounds, passage tombs or tumuli. Sometimes they are called fairy forts, and they were known as she in the native tongue. The people who lived there were the Ace She or Dina She, that is, the people of the She or the people of the hills. Their otherworldly domains are known by the names like the Land of the Young, the Plain of Honey, the Many Coloured Land, the Delightful Plain, and the Promised Land. Whatever we can say of these strange characters and the worlds they inhabit, it is from this realm that Ireland draws her deep wealth of fairy folklore, storytelling, and superstition. While it is almost dead among younger generations, belief in the fairies never really went away among a certain type of elderly country people, a sort which is now becoming increasingly rare in modern Ireland. It should be clear by now that these fairies are not the wish-granting nice fairies, the Tinkerbells or fairy godmothers that we see in Disney movies. In fact, the people had a deep fear of the fairies. They held superstitious beliefs about them and would go out of their way not to anger or upset them. The Reverend John O'Hanlon wrote on the topic of the native Irish belief in the fairy folk in his article titled Fairy Beliefs, Irish Folklore, saying they were regarded by the peasantry to 
to partake of a mixed human and spiritual nature. He continues, quote, Although invisible to men, particularly during the day, they hear and see all that takes place among mortals in which they have any special concern. Hence, the peasantry is always anxious to secure their good opinion and kind offices, and to propitiate or avert their anger by civil conversation and practices. Fairies are always mentioned with respect and reserve. It is also considered inhuman to strain potatoes or spill hot water on or over the threshold of a door, as thousands of spirits are supposed to congregate invisibly at such a spot, and would suffer from that infliction. Before drinking, a peasant would often spill a small portion of his draught on the ground as a complimentary libation to the good people. End quote. And while we see here that the people sometimes called them Ondini Maha, or the good people, this was done so out of fear of the fairies in case the fairies might be listening, and not because they were thought to be actually benevolent. In some accounts, it is portrayed that Tatua Hedadanan, the fairies, hate the men of Ireland for having driven them out of their worldly kingdom into the hills, which draws a parallel with the fallen angels of the Bible and the jinn of Islam. Mounds and tulloks were believed to be fairy forts and are still called so to this day. These were the otherworldly and magical domains of the fairies. Strange things are said to happen around them. Animals would not approach them, for example, and people dare not enter near them, and farmers dare not level them because of the fear of the wrath of the she dwelling inside. Perhaps the most well known of the she is that infamous Gaelic omen, the banshee, which literally means the woman she, or woman person of the hills, a woman fairy. Her wailing scream is said to be a portent of death to those who hear it, but traditionally she visits only certain Gaelic families. Following the logic of the word banshee, expert in Celticology and mythology, Peter Beresford Ellis has speculated that the word fairy may derive from far she, which would mean a man she, or a man person of the hills, or a man fairy, a fair she or a fairy, fairy. Incidentally, he considers that the word pixie could similarly derive from a reference to the Picts, a mysterious pre scotic race inhabited in North Britain who could be Pictshees or Pixies. Regardless of what we think of all this, the fairies, which are the minimised descendants of the Tuatha were thought to be real, and this had a significant influence on the beliefs and therefore the actions of the people who held to the superstitions. And of all of the fairy beliefs, the belief in the concept of the changeling was perhaps the most chilling and extreme. There was a deep fear that the fairies would snatch away a child or a relative and replace them with one of their own, an imposter. The belief was so strong and the fear so deep that it sometimes even led to the murder of children or relatives who were thought to be changelings. In 1895, Bridget Cleary was burned to death by her husband, Michael, and others who were convinced she had been replaced by a changeling. Since his true wife had been snatched away and replaced by the fairies, Michael believed he was just killing the evil changeling who had replaced his wife. Michael Cleary was found guilty of manslaughter and spent 15 years in prison. An old Irish nursery rhyme reads, Are you a witch, or are you a fairy, or are you the wife of Michael Cleary? Changelings have been the subject of stories, songs, poems and nightmares for a long time. It was the main theme of WB8's poem, The Stolen Child. Mm-hmm.